So I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers and Klaus for the invitation. And uh, Klaus is signaling something that I shouldn't be thanking. Um, and it's, it's great being here. It's a very nice uh, workshop. So I've got my outline here, what I'm going to say. And I, I don't know how well it comes out. I wasn't sure how, how it was going to look. This is a bit faded because I may never get to that point. But it's uh, stuff that I hope to, to get to. Um, uh, but I don't want to rush the rest. So I'll be talking about basically initially cold atoms, three-dimensional cold atoms. And the, the whole idea here is to discuss how a system crosses across the phase transition, what is the process. It's all going to be done by numerical simulations of appropriate models that I will be introducing. And so my idea is, is to show how do we actually get this uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. And I'll be giving a bit of an overview of the early and the more recent experiments that have been done to actually uh, get condensate growth, and then spending some time focusing on the experiment that uh, Gabriele mentioned uh, two days ago, and uh, addressing some of the questions that actually um, Adolf also mentioned earlier about uh, the, the link between kibble Zurich and actually what happens right after the kibble Zurich has taken place. So if there's time, then there's a different kind of physical system. So this will all be done in cold atoms. But uh, recently, um, exton polarities have become fashionable. And recently, compared to cold atoms recently, because they've been around for, for a long time now. And here, these are 2D systems. And they're actually driven, because this exton polariton is an unstable um, uh, quasi-particle. So they're driven dissipative systems. And they're 2D. And then the question is, what are similar features in a two-dimensional system? So I don't need to say much, because there's already been discussed about phase transition. But obviously, they happen everywhere. And there's different classes of transitions. We already heard the word about different universality class. And the question is, um, what happens at the transition is, is given by certain um, uh, critical exponents. And there's different exponents, as we heard already from Adolfo's uh, talk, a static exponent governing the equilibrium physics and a dynamical critical exponent. And uh, they're extremely hard to actually get. So I'm not going to be obtaining all of these critical exponents. But it's, uh, the idea is to try and see how much physics we can actually learn and, and what new insight can simulation give us about what's going on in the experiments. And so the system is basically called atoms. So, um, and the idea is I want to mimic this process. So here's a thermal gas. After expansion, this is the, the famous image for, for cold atoms that uh, uh, gave the Nobel Prize to uh, Cornell and Wyman. Um, so the idea is that you have a system of uh, thermal cold atoms. This is after they've been expanded from a harmonic trap. And if it's thermal, it's uh, um, uh, um, a Gaussian here. But once you get a condensate in an anisotropic trap, you start seeing this anisotropy in velocity distribution, which effectively tells you about the anisotropy inside the trap initially. And people can do many different traps. We heard uh, today also about box traps. People are working now uh, with ring traps. And there's a, a new experimental technique that people can just build any arbitrary potential. So if there's a good reason to build some very weird potential, experimentalists um, uh, can do that. All the imaging is done uh, optically. And pe uh, a lot of the uh, classification is done by looking at correlation functions. So. I was maybe over ambitious that I'm going to get to this part, but, but I'll do the, um, the introduction anyway I, for these systems of exton polaritons. So an exton polariton is an unstable, intrinsically unstable quasi-particle. Basically, the idea is that you have um, quantum wells, and you have a, a cavity, and you're th shining in a laser, and there's losses happening. So you have the exciton on the quantum well builds a, a, a short-lived, and when I say short-lived, it's about a picoseconds, a quasi-particle with the, the photon there. And this is what's called a, a polariton. And effectively, you change the um, uh, dispersion relation, and you actually have, rather than a, a flat line and a quadratic, you actually have this so-called upper and lower polariton branch, and all the condensation or um, all the coherence growth is happening at the bottom of this trap. But the quasi-particle itself is actually decaying. So in cold atoms, you can lose atoms from the trap, but the atoms are stable. Here is that the actual thing that's condensing is not stable. And actually, the physics that's probed, I mean, all the early papers talk about exton polariton condensation. But really, it is two-dimensional system. So the physics that's probed here is this berezinsky costelli saulus transition associated with vortex, uh, anti-vortex. Uh, 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 pairs and unbinding. 
And of course, such a transition has been seen in, in cold atoms, and I don't know if you were involved in, at all in this. So Cambridge Group did some uh, 2D stuff, so my chairman was also involved in that. So um, we've already seen this expression. So let's assume we have equilibrium and the system is approaching equilibrium, well, then the, uh, the coherence length of the system diverges as you're approaching the critical uh, region, and there's a critical exponent governing that. And here's the experiment from cold atoms from 10 years ago, uh, showing basically, well, this is a cartoon actually from the experiment, I'll show you the, uh, the other thing in a minute, showing how the correlation function basically changes as a function of temperature. We're really dealing in the region of the um, uh, transition, and then you can see how the correlation length, this is the correlation function, these blue lines, and you can see how the correlation length is diverging as you approach uh, the equilibrium. And here's the, the experimental uh, data of the correlation length as a function of reduced temperature. This is basically this parameter uh, that you're going away, this epsilon that uh, Adolfo uh, put up earlier today, which is how, you, how close you are to the critical temperature. And this is as you're going from above to below. So this is the divergence from above to below that we're seeing. The correlation length is diverging. And uh, it's quite impressive that um, with uh, this data and large error bars, they can still get a critical exponent, which is the expected critical exponent and agrees with the one uh, seen in helium, for example, and, and predicted. So uh, the workshop is about non-equilibrium. So I want to talk about the non-equilibrium uh, processes. So what about if, if you're quenching? And this has already been uh, uh, addressed the issue, so I can go a bit uh, faster through it. The idea is that you have all these uh, small random domains. This is still, there's no coherence. All of them are uncorrelated. And gradually, as you cross the transition, you form small micro domains, and they're separated by uh, defects or, or boundaries between them. And then gradually, it's the interaction of these boundaries and the merging that leads to your final uh, phase coherent uh, system. If you go slower, there's less of these domains because there's time for the nearby parts of the system to talk to each other and become correlated. So clearly the, the speed of the crossing uh, matters here. And these are some, some examples from the Cambridge group. Uh, this is after expansion in a box. Uh, and so you see if you go fast, you see something that has a lot more internal structure because of the, of the internal uh, fragmentation. <coughs> so to cross the transition, you're breaking a symmetry. We go with something that has no preferred phase to something where you have a well-defined uh, phase in the system. And, uh, well, we've already seen this critical slowing down in terms of the uh, equilibrium uh, properties. Now, when we go dynamically, there's also a divergence in the relaxation time. And this is the diagram that Adolfo uh, was explaining uh, this morning. So the idea is you start cooling and you're trying to get to the other side. You start above TC. But at some point, you can't really follow this equilibrium divergence. You have, you're, you're going at the finite speed. So at some point, you fall out of equilibrium with, this, uh, uh, with the equilibrium system. And at that point, the symmetry breaks. You cross the system, and you grow to the other side. And so any experiment is always finite in duration. So you will always get this finite symmetry breaking, and you're crossing uh, across the transition. And it all depends on how fast you're crossing, which is an externally imposed cooling ramp. Uh, in the system. And this is a simplified form of uh, um, the kibble zurich phenomenon. It says basically the number of defects that forms between all these patches scales as a, a function of your, uh, your quench time scale with an inverse power law, alpha. And alpha will depend on these uh, dynamic and static uh, critical exponents. It also depends on the dimensionality and the geometry of the system. And this has been observed in many, many systems. And actually, it's Adolfo's review that I would recommend. It's one of the two reviews that he said he had, if you want to find out more about uh, Kibble Zurich. OK. So talking about uh, cold atoms, I thought uh, that I would start, since uh, uh, there's uh, uh, quite a, a, a high interest here in, in kinetic and non-equilibrium approach, I thought I would start by motivating the approaches and get it out of the way. I'm not going to go into many technical details and then move on to the physics and the results. So there's two approaches I'll be, I'll be using here to discuss various aspects of condensate growth. And they're very different in nature. So there's kinetic approaches and stochastic approaches. Okay? In the kinetic approaches, it's like a, a two-fluid model in helium. You assume you have a condensate. This is a phase-coherent structure. And then everything else that you're describing is the non-condensate 
which we just say is the thermal cloud, basically. And so you have this system coupled. So this is what you would use uh, more routinely in condensed matter, but this relies on symmetry breaking. So I'm saying when I take my Bose field operator, I actually have a part which has a well-defined phase, and then I have the rest of the stuff where the interesting physics is happening, the, the, the thermal cloud that is coupled to it. So that's one approach. And that approach, of course, cannot, you, you already start a priori saying you have a condensate. So it can't actually describe the crossing through the phase transition, even though it can describe a lot of the actual growth properties, but, but not the phase transition itself. The other approach is a stochastic approach. And uh, the idea is you describe in a unified way, not just the condensate, but a whole load of modes, if you like, those modes that are affected by the presence of the condensate, the quasi-particle modes, everything that's not purely thermal, is described together. And uh, this approach can be, has been derived in different ways. I mean, you could just write it by thinking or as a Langevin equation, but there are derivations coming both from a quantum optics perspective and from a path integral perspective, and uh, the end equations are effectively the same. So starting with, with the kinetic approaches, um, I just want to, to motivate this model because it's actually very useful for studying a whole range of phenomena. Um, so the idea is, in a simplified cartoon picture, one has the condensate, it's all in a harmonic trap, uh, um, and then you have a non-condensate, which is your thermal particle. So I do this distinction uh, artificially, so I'm dealing with two uh, systems, the condensate and the thermal cloud, and then I can formulate the time-dependent equations for the two. And really, gross pitaevsky in this context would describe just the interactions within the condensate, even though, of course, this is the, uh, re the, the, the correct ground state, not just the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. And then the ordinary Boltzmann equation would describe the part of thermal-thermal collisions, but then because I have those two systems, I have exchange of particles between the two, which is what is labeled here. And so the idea is that the gross pitaevsky equation, which is the fundamental equation for uh, cold atoms, gets two new terms. One of them is because the, cold, the uh, condensate sits in the presence of a thermal cloud, so this is just a mean field correction, and then this is the transfer of particles into or out of the condensate, uh, basically. And so this is time dependent and is governed by the other equation which gives us the motion of the thermal particles. So effectively I have, a, a, by construction, a closed system uh, of equations and we can relate all those terms together which has both mean field but also um, a, a, um, collisional coupling so the, uh, you can have particle transfer from one system to the other. Okay, so we've heard a bit, so I don't need to go into detail actually this morning about hydrodynamic and non-hydrodynamic or I, I prefer the word, by the way, mean field dominated rather than collisionless regime because collisionless to me suggests that there are no collisions and actually uh, from my perspective what I do is I'm solving this regime, the collisionless regime, where all of the physics comes from the collisions. So it's a bit misleading to call that uh, collisionless. I told Alan Griffin many times about that. He had his own strong views um, on the word, which is, of course, an established uh, word. But the key thing is how fast are collisions happening, which you can estimate. And if you're in the hydrodynamic regime, then you can describe a whole lot of systems and also unitary Fermi gases and so on. But in the majority of uh, cold atom experiments, they are in the collisionless regime, uh, the mean field dominated one. And so that's where I'm going to be talking about. So let me uh, get the other approach out of the way, the stochastic approach. So it looks very similar to a gross pitaevsky equation, but now I have this term here, which couples atoms in and out of my condensate, and this is a stochastic noise term. So the idea is, I mean, this is just a Langevin equation. So the idea is basically I have now, in a unified way, all the so to say, relevant modes of the system. So it's not just the condensate, but it's all the modes that are affected by it, and then everything above it is thermal. And there has to be a cutoff here, which of course, this is an approximation, because we're using an effective field theory to describe uh, um, a, a, a quantum system. And so uh, the idea here is, under certain approximations, and certain approximation basically means throwing away the Bose-Einstein distribution function, you actually uh, relax to a rayleigh genes distribution. Uh, you can write the above term and also assuming that all of these atoms are static, so really there is a rate that transfers particles 
but nothing is happening to this part of the system. So this is my bath, and here is the system that I'm considering. And then you can rewrite it in this way, which is like a, a, a Gross-Witevsky equation with a dissipation term here. I could have even put that in phenomenologically. But then there's a, a noise term here, and those two have to be coupled to satisfy. Uh, uh, so these two terms are coupled to satisfy fluctuation dissipation theorem. And of course, they're related to the temperature in the system. So the idea is, by solving uh, this equation now, you can actually see how uh, particle redistribution is happening into this part of the system, and then you have to do some extra work to find what is your condensate and what is not your condensate. So in a sense here, we get something that looks like what you might get from the experiment, and then we have to do numerical analysis to separate out the two parts of the system. Are there any questions on the... Okay. So, oh, and one more thing to say. So just to give you an idea with this stochastic model, because that's the one. Well, technically, this part should be much larger than, th than here. And very often in cold atoms, that is the case. But of course, when you go to different geometries, like I'll be considering a quasi-1D geometry, uh, it really depends on whether you have many particles in it, for example, or not, how large is, is, is your static bath. In, in the things I'm considering, there is still a, a large number of atoms up here. But I wouldn't necessarily say that the population here is really, really small compared to that. So it is an approximation. The, the idea is that these are primarily thermal as well, these modes. So in a sense, I'm still taking account of some thermal uh, dynamics, but not the full set. So these modes here are scarcely populated, less than, say, one per mode. So that's why you can throw away the dynamics. But it is an approximation, of course. It's not... Uh, sorry? Ah, so you solve th this equation is easy to solve numerically, so you basically uh, start with, with a noise seed and you can work out analytically what you would expect that, uh, that noise to be, and then you just propagate in time. Uh, no, here I work with real particles. In the previous method, I work with test particles. So if I look in a 2D setting, what does a single run look like? Uh, if I start from nothing, I'm just seeding it with this noise, then I will get some kind of growth into the system, and then I'm, I'm getting to the equilibrium one. But there's loads of fluctuations in the system in a single run. If I want to get global properties, like whether it's uh, uh, correlation functions or density profiles, I have to do appropriate average over these. Or if I want to count statistics of uh, defects, for example, that form, I have to do appropriate averaging over many different realizations uh, to get the physics out. So. We've uh, spent a lot of time, I don't want to go into detail on that, testing this tool for equilibrium. So for equilibrium, this stochastic uh, equation is very well done. We've analyzed a whole range of experiments that have been done in 1D and 2D geometries and finding that we can really describe not just densities but phase fluctuations and density fluctuations very, very accurately and also completely ab initio. For equilibrium, it's very easy to deal with the cutoff and actually get the full picture without relying on any input from the experiment. For dynamics, you actually end up, even though I can write the theory in, and there's derivations of the theory, effectively we rely on one parameter from the experiment for the dynamics. So if you're interested in the constant growth, uh, uh, I, I recommend this uh, review that we have, which covers a lot, primarily from the cold atom physics uh, review. But what I want to talk is about what has been done in cold atoms. So starting going back 20 years now in the first experiment in, in Catalyst Group, where basically the idea in cold atoms is you have a harmonic trap, you have all the atoms in here, and you're gradually lowering the height of this wall so that you get atoms lost and the rest are thermalizing. So, uh, but what you can actually do is you can actually prepare a state above TC and then you lower this quite quickly. So you do shock evaporative cooling, you're truncating your distribution basically, and then you see how the condensate forms. And this is the first experiments on condensate growth done uh, 20 years ago. So if you look in terms of the number of particles in this system, then you get the number of particles, this experimental data as a function of, of time, was growing, you see these data points and the best line fit. And the idea is it's a slow initial start because you're getting the seed into the condensate and then you're getting stimulated emissions. So as soon as you have a few particles in the condensate, more want to go. So that explains this, this slope until you equilibrate. So there's been two different uh, theories. 
uh, that have explained uh, this data reasonably well. I don't want to go into detail. Uh, this theory has accounts for spontaneous uh, and stimulated processes, whereas this approach here is the approach I just described with some approximations on, on top of it, uh, the kinetic approach. So you have to start with a small seed here. You see there's nothing, if you start with zero, there's nothing to give you a non-zero condensate. But if you put a seed here, you can still capture the growth. So in a sense, it's quite remarkable that you can actually capture the condensate growth subject from a theory that already assumes you have a small condensate in the system and you have phase coherence. Um, we use this approach. So there's another approach to cooling, which is evaporative cool at the surface. So imagine you have your condensate here, and you're moving it to a room temperature surface at a constant speed. So what happens as you're moving close to the surface, you will start getting atom loss. But you're getting a compression, and this compression is enough to make sure that you get into the right phase space densities for condensate formation to happen. And so you move it to some distance, and you hold it there, and you study how, much how, how quickly the condensate forms, and you can vary the distance at which you, you hold uh, the system. And again, with this kinetic approach, I mean, we have to use the seed, but it's remarkable, you can actually see condensate growth as, in fa as a function of time taking place in the system. And here's an experiment of the number uh, of atoms in the system. So you get loss as you're moving close to the surface. And so um, these are three different hold positions uh, that you have. And these are experimental data and our theoretical uh, prediction. What I would like to highlight here, which is quite uh, remarkable, is that I talked about a seed, putting a seed into the system. But actually, if you look at this plot here, what you're seeing is the number of atoms is going down, but the number of thermal atoms is going down more, and you're getting the condensate forming. So even though I have a seed of condensate, you can see it's pretty much I start at zero, and I get my condensate growth. So it's actually quite remarkable that you can even use a mean field-based uh, model, a kinetic equation, to actually describe uh, processes like that uh, with a numerical uh, seed. So there's been subsequent experiments, and the dynamics was explained quite well, okay, subsequent to the first Ketterly one, but there was always this undetermined time delay. So when people were fitting things, they had to determine at which point to start the fitting in the function. That was an unknown which is somehow related to the microphysics of the, of the system, how it's being quenched, and also the geometry and the particle number. And then people started looking as well into the growth of coherence dynamically. Uh, so here is an experiment showing the growth of the uh, phase correlation function, but now it's in time, not as you're approaching the, the critical region. And what was found is that basically the coherence this visibility marks essentially the coherence of the system is growing on a similar time scale to the time scale that atoms is growing. Because it was the question, does, does the system grow coherently all along or not? And then we come to this new generation of experiments which actually chose to deliberately uh, break the symmetry by going very, very fast and actually quenching through the phase transition. And there's been a lot of, uh, of studies on that. And the study that uh, Gabriele mentioned a couple of days ago is this uh, quasi-1D study. And what they found, now we're entering the regime of kibble zurich physics because we're dynamically breaking the symmetry and we're seeing how does uh, the system form. And so what they found in Trento and also in another experiment in, in, in Paris, what they found was that indeed there seems to be a power law decay for the number of uh, defects as a function of the, uh, the quench rate. And this power law is in agreement with, with kibble zurek But here's the problem that I had when I started looking at this problem. For a start, how realistic is kibble zurek Well, Adolfo spoiled it this morning by saying, well, kibble zurek just describes the symmetry breaking, and then there's a lot of internal dynamics, which is what I want to, to address. But then the other thing I had is, why are the features seen in experiments so clean? In these experiments here where they're counting defects, actually, they were counting the defects a long time after the transition. You heard from Adolfo how you really have to count the defects effectively in the transition region, and that's where kibble Zurich holds. So why is it that this scaling still holds? Now, there were, of course, other experiments, like in Cambridge, where they looked at correlation functions, and they were able to get nice properties of the system. So, but in, in, in these experiments here, uh, all the measurements were done after, long after the, the phase transition. So that's what I would like to answer uh, now.
So here's the, the, the protocol. You saw that in a slightly different uh, uh, representation by Gabriele. The, the idea is this is showing the quench protocol in the Trento experiment. So as a function of time, basically you start at some thermal state, uh, pr prepare some state, and then start a ramp from above TC to some point below TC. Okay? And then you wait for a certain amount of time, and then you allow the system to expand to actually be able to see what kind of features you have so you can observe your, your defects. And so really, if you were talking about Kibble Zurich, you would probably be talking somewhere around here. I mean, it, it depends on exactly how quickly you were quenching. That's where you should be counting the defects, not down there. So why, why does it work? Because it does work. Um, so these are some typical images from the Trento experiment. You've seen some similar ones uh, from, from Gabriele. And what they found is there's four plots here. Let's just focus on one of them. Let's say we focus on, on the green one because that's the one I, I, I'm analyzing. So this shows the defect number as a function of the quench rate. Okay? If the quench is very, very fast, you get a saturation. You can't have too many defects in the growing system. Adolf already touched on that. So here's the saturation of the number of defects. But when the quench is not extremely fast, it's, not, it, it's, it's much slower than instantaneous, then you see a power law scaling. Okay? What is shown here, the four different graphs, are, are showing how quasi-1D the system is. So this is the aspect ratio, so it's the ratio effectively of the transverse to the um, uh, longitudinal uh, size or, or, or trapping frequency. Um, so the idea is that th they're all a bit different, but, but they're all similar in some sense. They all fall within the expected range. It's not exactly clear what Kibble Zurich would predict here. We have an inhomogeneous system, and uh, also the defects that are here are not really solitons, they're not really vortices. So there are predictions for a homogeneous system with a soliton and a vortex. Here it's a bit more complicated, but all of these are consistent with uh, the interpretation that it's something between a soliton and a vortex. So what I would like to show you here, and I need to exit this mode for a second, otherwise it doesn't play, um, is show you a movie of what our stochastic simulations uh, give. So wh what I'm doing, let me explain what this movie I is showing here. So I start with a thermal state. So I don't start with nothing in my atom. I start with a thermal state above TC, and I'm quenching at a linear rate to below TC. And what is shown here is a density isosurface. So I'm, I'm seeing this fragmentation. This is just loads of noise. If I would cut and look at it, it's just basically noise distributed. And as I'm cooling, I will actually, uh, at the linear rate, I will actually see the formation of defects. So what you see, the system is, is, it starts cooling. You see the formation of, of these defects. And now these defects start interacting, and you get all these vortex reconnections. Now, uh, uh, Gabriele focused on the regime where this was used to generate a, a certain number of defects and then study their interactions. But here we're studying the process of how the system gets there. And you see there's a very sudden crossing of the phase transition, loads of defects, but we can't really count them at that point. And then there's this whole evolution. And the experiments were measuring things about at the end of these simulations and uh, then doing expansion imaging and counting the defects. So this is very different physics, but as I will show you, actually, it seems that the, the scaling of Kibble Zurek is more or less uh, preserved, which is why uh, they, they found. OK. So if I now try the movie runs fast, if I now try to show you basically what's going on. So at some point, we start seeing from this very broad and noisy distribution, we start seeing a narrowing into the distribution. We know as we start to condense, we have a narrowing uh, a, uh, of the distribution. And so we see that, and we see all this noise coming. These are all the defects. This is about the time when I should be counting the defects if I was interested in looking at Kibble Zurek. Of course, even numerically, this is a very challenging thing to count this number of defects. If I take a cut, maybe, then I can have a well-defined number uh, counting. But here, they're all very intricate. So what happens during the process? Then eventually, a condensate emerges, and it's got all those defects. And you can see how hard it is still to count the defects. I don't know how many defects those are, but clearly reconnections are playing a key role. And then what goes on? There's all these 
reconnections, and of course defects can be lost, and the system is growing at the same time. So it's growing vertically, it's already more or less relaxed, but uh, uh, actually it's still growing. And then in the end, you're left with this regime where you just have few defects, and that's the regime that uh, Gabriele was focusing uh, in his talk. And eventually, you get equilibration, so you get a nice form condensate. Now, in all the simulations I've done, I've started from a given initial condition and gone to a given final condition. So my condensate for all the different rates is always the same at the end once I will equilibrate it, just to be able to keep track of what's going on. Um, so here's just a, a close-up of the snapshot of crossing the phase transition. You can see all these random uh, defects emerging, and it happens very, very fast. And then after that, you see these green regions. These are high-density regions, so you start forming pockets of condensates here and there, but they all have different phase. And gradually, as the defects are dying away, the phase is unifying, and then you get this, uh, this picture here. But it's a very complicated process because the system is growing, so there's an axial and radial expansion. This is also stretching these defects. And there's also reconnections, and defects can also be lost at the edges in what uh, uh, Gabriele and, co uh, and co-workers called um, a vortex ejection. So, Here's an example of all these nice reconnections, and this is in answer to, you, to the question that th there was on Gabriele's talk about whether you ever see rings appear. So here's a ring appearing transiently during the evolution. It's not a well-formed ring, but it happens uh, during the evolution. So to model the experiment, then we want to get growth curves. And this is all now, everything I'm showing you, of course, is with a stochastic approach, so we don't have a problem with seeding uh, the condensate. But there's still a question, at what point do we start comparing with experiment? I mean, it's very hard to define TC, and anyway, this is an inhomogeneous system, so the t uh, condensation is not happening always at the same position. T, uh, uh, t over TC is varying uh, as a function of position in real time. So the idea is we take a measure that is sensible in experiments, so we can uh, uh, equilibrate, so we choose a certain fraction of the final condensate fraction and we say that's when in the experiment you could actually detect that you had a condensate. Because at the beginning it's very noisy, you wouldn't be able to see you have a condensate. And so we fixed our fraction to the experimental uh, fraction here. And that gave us this shift. You see this is labeled in time minus TBEC, which is the time when we fix, when we get a certain fraction. And so what you see is for different cooling rates, all the symbols, the black symbols, are experimental data. And of course, the final state in the experiment varied from run to run, but we took a fixed final state. That's why they always go to the same, uh, the simulations go to the same final point. But the idea was that we, in each of these plots, we show cooling rates which are a bit above and a bit below the experimental ones. And what you can see is that in this range of cooling rates, we have very good agreement in the growth with the experiment. Okay, so we have two independent time scales. One is this time scale that we say, when has the condensate formed? This is not the ta same time scale as T hat in Kibble Zurich. In fact, it's much after uh, T hat. This is the time when you see a well-formed condensate that you could observe. And its definition is somewhat arbitrary, because if you get better resolution, you can detect smaller condensates, that, then that time would shift. But all the scalings we find are independent of that. And then there's a growth time scale, which just has to do with fitting all of these growth curves with an S-shaped curve. So this is just a shape that we get, and it's independent of whether we have uh, shifted the graphs or not. So these are two independent uh, time scales. So here's a snapshot in the evolution of the defect type. And if I now look at cuts, just to try and understand what's going on, if you look at cuts in the 2D planes, well, this is, in the, this is the y equals 0 plane, sorry, that's shown in, in the cuts. And if you look at the integrated 1D density, you see really that you get these individual uh, defects. They're washed out when you integrate, so you don't see them as deep. If you would take a cut, which you can only do in, ideally in theory, then you see very clear uh, defects. But as time goes on, this random patch in the phase emerges to something which is very clean. Okay? And you have a few defects, you have a well-formed condensate, and you have these phase profiles. And this is a 2 pi phase winding, except it's not symmetric as you go around, but it's, it's stretched. And that has to do with the geometry. Uh, Gabriel already explained that. The idea is that you have a solitonic vortex in the system, which has a 2 pi phase winding, so it's not a soliton, but actually it is a squashed uh, uh, phase winding. And that has to do with the geometry of the system. Okay, 
So what about this dependence on the quench rate? Here's an illustration of one single run for each of uh, different quenches. And these are realistic duration quenches from 84 milliseconds to 600 milliseconds, the quenches. They start at the same time, and we're seeing what happens. So we see two things. Firstly, there's a slower crossing of the phase transition as you're going. So in, in terms of real time, this system crossed the phase transition slower than here. Also. At a later time, you see you have more defects uh, in, the fast, um, in the fast quench than in the slow quench. Of course, that will vary from run to run, the exact number of defects. So I'm going to do some statistics uh, in a minute. And the other thing you see, which is quite important, is actually it relates to one of the questions when people started studying condensate growth experiments, is how coherent does the system form? Actually, if you go very slowly, most of the time, the system, once you can detect it, is really coherent. It doesn't really have any defects. If you go adiabatically slowly, you'll get no defects in the system. Whereas if you quench, you always end up with some defects. And this is related to the issue of how you go from above TC to a condensate through a so-called quasi-condensate phase, where there's local patches and, and the phase is not constant across the system. So if we now do some statistics and we look at the number of defects as a function of our time from this uh, uh, defined phase transition, we see that at the beginning we have a large number. It depends, of course, on how fast the quench rate is. It's faster for, for faster quench rates. But there's a very rapid decay region where all these there's a lot of defects in a small region, and so they die away. And in the end, you get a few defects, a handful of defects left, and they are long-lived. They're long-lived because you have a very large sample, you have a few defects, and so most of the time they spend their time going around in the trap and only occasionally they're reconnecting. And also you see this saturation that I mentioned and was observed in the experiment that if you try to go faster and faster, you don't really, after a long time, get many defects. So if we look at this part here where uh, the defect number saturates after a long evolution time, then we can go back to this experimental curve that we had before, these black points I'm showing here. The number of defects as a function of our quench rate or inverse cooling rate. And what we can look at is at different times in the evolution, how does this pattern change? And what we find is sure enough, we see that there's a plateau in the number of defects for very fast quenches because this is not a kibble zurich regime. Here we see something that resembles kibble zurich we don't have enough statistics to get a, 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 an exact exponent. But anyway, the exponent is irrelevant unless you measure a t hat, actually, in my opinion. Uh, kibble Zurich is a cartoon. You have to have Kibble Zurich and coarse graining. It's a combination of the two effects. But what we see is whether you simulate at 50 or at 200 milliseconds of evolution, the experiment was at 250, the blue and the red points, the slope in the curve here isn't changing much. The theoretical predictions for a homogeneous system for soliton and vortex would be 7 over 3 and 7 over 6. And we're certainly within that, but our numerics doesn't tell us anything more than that, other than that we're broadly consistent with the experimental findings. So let me now address the, 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 the coherence issue. So we want to look at how coherence grows into the system. And here we are, we are motivated by the uh, work that was done at Cambridge in a box. And we tried to look at coherence by choosing a central region, then shifting that region and correlating it with the system and trying to see basically the correlation length uh, that way. And so at the beginning, we're above TC. We have essentially no coherence. Both uh, our initial state in the dynamical and the equilibrium correlation function is the same. And as we're growing, we see the formation of coherence. So the green is if the system is fully phase coherent because of the way coherence is extracted. When there's full phase coherence, this is a straight line here because of this formula. Um, but as it's growing, you can see for a slow ramp, it grows rather quickly and it becomes fully phase coherent. Whereas for a faster ramp, because there's all these uh, uh, defects in the system and the phase hasn't equilibrated, it takes a very, very long time to relax. So you really see the difference in the equilibration of the correlation function and uh, the relaxation of the system to something phase coherent. So here, essentially, you're growing almost into something phase coherent, and here you have a lot of defects in the system. And now we can try to make a bit this a bit more quantitative. And so I had all these different growth curves. I had two independent time scales, TBC and tau G. And now I plot all of those different curves onto one. And you see you can collapse. If you measure, if you scale to the intrinsic growth time scale, all the curves fall on top of each other. 
But now I want to see how correlated are this, how much coherence do these systems have. And I call this recoherence in the sense the system starts, it's close to equilibrium, it falls out of equilibrium at TC, and then it gradually relaxes to equilibrium again. And so I'm, I, I define this measure, which tells us how different is the dynamical from the equilibrium one scale to the equilibrium. And so here's what we see exactly on the same time scale. So we see that even though the, the growth of what uh, we have defined as, as a condensate is really all following the same growth dynamics, you can see that for the very slow quenches, you can see that this has reached, this is fully non-coherent, this is effectively the moment of the phase transition, and this is where it has uh, equilibrated to a fully phase coherent condensate. So this happens about five in these scaled units, and this is about the same time as the density uh, uh, reaching maximum. But if you go faster and faster because of all the defects that are there, they don't allow uniform phase coherence across, and you see it takes a lot longer for the system to reach equilibrium uh, in the end. And so we see this decoupling going back to the question of, uh, that, that was asked earlier in one of the experiments about the interplay between the growth in number and coherence. You see here with appropriate uh, definition, the number growth is all the same, but the coherence is very different because it's growing with phase fluctuations. So I think because I'm, 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 uh, I've run out of time basically, I would like to uh, make sure I just conclude with giving you this, this message that I wanted to, to show. So we started with a thermal gas above TC and we equilibrated to a finite temperature BEC. I mean, this is not a pure BEC, there's still uh, a large con a thermal fraction here. And depending on how fast or slow we go, the growth can happen much after the ramp has, has finished and uh, that's when uh, everything happens and you have a lot more defects. But if you go very slow, you grow into a phase coherent condensate basically. And the person who did uh, most of the simulations I've shown here is, is Gary Liu, shared between me and uh, his actual supervisor and boss, who's Shishuan Gao in Taiwan. And then it's been done jointly with all the experimentalists and, and Gabriele, who, who's here. And I didn't have time to talk about the polariton part. I, I wanted to shamelessly also advertise my books. Um, so if you're interested in methods, most of the chapters are, by the way, that's my excuse, on the archive. So if you know that there's a chapter, you can look at the contents and then look for the chapter on archive. So if you're interested in methods for cold gases, these are all edited books. Uh, there's, th there's this book here and some review articles. And if you're interested in the issue of general Bose-Einstein condensation across different energy and length scales all the way to the astrophysical, then this is a, a recent book that has uh, come out. And, uh, well, I didn't have time to talk about um, exon polaritons, and uh, I will leave it as that. But I want to just mention that we have actually done a whole analysis. There's an archive paper, if you're interested in, in these exon polaritons, where we really looked at both kibble zurich and long-time phase-ordering kinetics, and we can extract the dynamical critical exponent with, with very, very good accuracy for those systems. Thank you for your attention. I have actually two, two questions. Yes. Uh, uh, are the finite size effects in the kibble zurek uh, mechanism understood? Un no. So, so then it is very difficult to, to compare with the prediction of, of kibble zurek uh, when, when you make the finite size calculation. No? Yes, absolutely. And so part of my motive, I mean, when, the, the, when I started that, my interest was to see kibble zurek Now that I've completed the analysis, my interest was more to see how do you go from something which is thermal in equilibrium to something which is condensed in equilibrium when you're crossing through the phase transition. And I'm less interested in the exact details of kibble zurek But in the context of kibble zurek one thing that is becoming I I um, more and more recognized, but was not maybe uh, recognized in the early days, is the importance of these coarse graining dynamics, the fact that all these defects are, are interfering, and the, the difficulty with which you can validate exactly kibble zurek I mean, kibble zurek is a great thing. It gives you a great insight, and remarkably, it works in regimes where it shouldn't work. I mean, it gives you more or less the correct physics, but uh, it's, it's meaningless in a finite size system, which is also inhomogeneous, which is important to, to say whether you agree or don't agree exactly with the kibble Zurek scale. Uh, can I ask another question? Well, uh, 
maybe I misunderstood you, but I, I, I got an impression that you, you're showing the number of defects yes. uh, and their propagation, and maybe you, you try to, 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 to relate them to the experimental yes. values. What in the simulation you are doing, what guarantees that you have the, the correct number of these defects? I would understand that this must be very sensitively depending on the way the simulation is being done or the assumed geometry or a right. lot of details, no? Yes, so what we have done here is when I was showing you the movie, the movie was done for parameters that match as closely as possible the average parameters in the experiment. And so what we have done is taken those parameters, and actually that means, which is a bit tricky here, we don't just change temperature, but we also have a linear ramp in chemical potential. In the experiment, they have real losses. We don't put loss into a system, but we allow for the atom number to change by putting a time-dependent chemical potential, which has the same slope, but uh, so starting from negative to, to large positive, uh, which goes over the same uh, time duration. So uh, any single run, will give us a number of defects, then we do a few runs, we don't have a great statistics, and, and we get the average, and it seems that you, you very quickly converge to a number of defects. Now, of course, if I would change things, if I would change, for example, the cutoff, the absolute number of vortices would probably change. I mean, the whole thing here is to demonstrate that we get qualitatively the right features, and also that we get a Kibble zurek like scaling. I mean, I, I wouldn't even, you know, if there was no Kibble zurek there's no way to fit something here, other than say that if there was an exponent, it's something in that range. And, uh, but, but I agree, it's, it, it's the best that one can do, and also we've taken a parameter, the growth parameter gamma, from the experiment. So to be as close to the experiment, but also that, that means that it's not exactly ab initio, because we've taken something from the experiment. Thank you. Uh, I would like first to glad the, the conference for giving me the opportunity of giving this talk. Um, I am from University for Federal University of Minas Gerais. Uh, here we have a picture of the site C and of the roof of our building. Um, here is our group meeting, our group research, the Enlight Entanglement and Quantum Inform and and quantum optical theory. Uh, this work was made with uh, these two collaborators. Alberto de Paulo is another student, PhD student from my university, and Rafael Drummond, which is in this conference, and is my advisor. Um, uh, as the title says, I will talk about the um, Ising model. Here I'm considering uh, the ice model given by this Hamiltonian, which I have interaction between, I have a lattice, and I have interaction between first nate bars of this lattice. And I'm considering only transverse, transverse external magnetic fields. Uh, it's more standard to consider only in the x direction, but I can also consider in the y direction this external magnetic fields. Uh, so they still are transverse uh, comparing with the interactions, but they do not need to be all in the same direction. And I will consider as the first part of the talk, let's like, like this, which I have two sides, uh, which they do just have one side as their, in their intersection, and they do not have they interact only in direct the other sides, just interact the other the sides of X interact with sides of Y only by this intersection of the site which I'm calling L. Um, so what is the shielding property? Um, it is for systems described by the transverse Ising model, which is in the, the Gibbs state. 
given by this formula where bet is the inverse of temperature. And I will consider the external magnetic field nu in that side of the middle, the intersection between the, the two sides, there is no magnetic field there. So we have shown that the reduced state of one side has no dependence on the parameters of the other side. That is, the, ex the reduced state of this set here has no dependence on the interactions between sides of X, neither the magnetic field is applied here. It is surprising because you, can, you could have a really strong interaction, as big as you want, and this, the, this reduced state cannot detect this. Um, I will show a sketch of the proof because it's short, it's easy, and it's beautiful. Uh, for showing this sketch, I will consider, um, I will consider um, simpler, a simpler a particular case where I have just the I just have the magnetic ma the magnetic fields in the x direction, and I am will consider the, that the lets that my lets is a chain. Here I am labeling the 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 number of each site, and I will make we will choose some site to make this external magnetic field new. Um, so I wish to show that this side has no dependence on here or on this other side, and Hamiltonian with two terms. H line is the Hamiltonian, the part of the Hamiltonian, the terms of this side of the left side of the chain, and H two lines, the the parameters of the terms of the this other side. Um, so I have that the here I'm considering the Gibbs states without normalization. I will not I will not care with with normalizations now. It will be done at the end. Uh, so exponential of the Hamiltonian, I can multiply these two terms since these two terms will commute. I'm doing the I will not have sigma x here, so these two sides will commute. Um, to calculate the partial trace here, the reduced state here, I have to calculate the partial trace of, of my state. Um, so, uh, using this separation here, I can show that this, the partial trace, I have just to calculate the partial trace of H line. Uh, here, I'm hiding some details of this calculation, not directed like this. So with what I will show is that this term here is proportional to the identity operator. So it's being proportional to the identity operator. I will perform normalizations. And then I will have just on this term here at the for the describing my partial my my partial straight, my the reduced state. And here I mean wrote what I just tell. Um, so, for to making that, so I will now I will try to show that this quantity here is proportional to the identity operator. To make that, I will use the series expansion of the exponential. So, to show that this quantity is proportional to the identity, I just have to show that it every power of h line partial trace of the powers of H line is proportional to the identity operator. Uh, remember that H line is the sum of is is the sum of the the sites one to L, the interactions between the first the sites of the left side of the chain. Um, to explain uh, the technique that I use it to show this, I will, use, I will use a particular case where I will set the, the external magnetic field no at the third site. So I have to calculate the partial trace only on sites one and two. And um, 
I will spec specify more. I will set an equal tree, just to show the idea. Um, then each, each line elevated by three, it's, it's this expression for this, this tr these three sites. And I have to calculate the partial trace of space of site one and two. Um, performing this calculation here, I would get this big formula that can be seen that as the sum of two terms. One, the first term there, the, the first terms, I have the operator in the third site equal identity. And this last one, this, this last one, I will have the operator of the third site equal three. I have to show that these terms here, the partial trace, will be equal zero. Here will be another constant. After normalization, this constant will disappear. But here, in this example, we could make direct calculations and show that this is zero. I would just, I would just, I would choose this term here to show the method. This term, this last one, which I have chosen, is the multiplication of this term, this term, and after this other term. I will make this product like this. Here is my chain, and you will associate like a game board to this chain. For the first two, for the sides of the left, one and two, I will associate two squares. And that, that side where I make the magnetic field zero, I will associate one line. Each of one of these corners will represent one operator, sigma z, sigma y, sigma x, and identity. And here, just sigma z and identity. Um, I will write here that operators that I want to make the, the they are sigma z inside you times sigma x inside two times sigma z inside two, sigma z inside three. So here I'm representing the first the, the first terms. They are sigma one, sigma one, and identity. It's like I'm putting white pieces in this game board. Now I will multiply by sigma x. Then multiplying by sigma x, it is in the side two. So just the second piece will move. It will move down here. It will be proportional to sigma y. Now I will perform the third term. I will multiply the third term. And it, this piece here will move to the right, and this other piece will move to the left, performing my, my multiplication. Note that always that I multiply some some piece by sigma z, it will go to the, it will change their side. It will move to the left or to the right. Do not matter its position. When I multiply by sigma x, it will just change its height. Note that I always, sigma z and sigma, always sigma z in my calculation here, in my h line three, appears just with pairs. They do not appear alone. So if I start with an even number of pieces at the, the left, here I have two pieces at the left. I perform the calculation. At the end, I have still an even number of pieces at the left. Since I just moved the, the, the side of the piece uh, in couples, I will always have an even number of sides of the at the left. Here, we can see that when, when my piece is of the third side is occupying sigma 3, I have at least one piece in the squares occupying some position in the left. The only way for, the, for my partial trace do not be zero is that the piece would be identity, identity, and sigma 3. 
but I do not have this as because of this argument. So always that my piece is here, the trace will be zero. So uh, the trace has to be the identity operator, a constant times identity operator. I could have this the configuration identity, identity, and identity. It could happen dependent of the term. But identity, identity, sigma tree, it's forbidden. Um, this is this argument can be quite generate quite can be can be done for this let's also, which I have only one side here. I just would take associate another game board for the slats um, and use the same ergomet. Always that I have this piece here, one of the pieces of this one of this square at least has to be have a piece at the left. Um, so with this argument we prove that the reduced state here has no dependence on the parameters of this other side. Um, as the ground, the Gibbs state, it goes to, it tends to the ground state when the temperature is made, is goes to zero. When I make beta tends to infinity, so this property also works for ground states. Um, this property is a property of the transverse Ising model. If I have here, I have a counter, a counter example that I, I have a Hamiltonian which has a field per long, per, um, longitudinal, longitudinal field. It is in the same direction of the interactions. And we can show that the reduced state, uh, here I have a, a chain also, and I apply a magnetic field at the first site. We can show that the reduced state of the last site is dependent of the, this magnetic field. So this property is special of the transverse Ising model. Um, it, one way of understanding better this property is using the duality of the transverse Ising, Ising model. Here we write, we write the operators we define another operators using my s the Pauli operators. And we can rewrite the Hamiltonian of the Ising model in this way such that J will perform the, the interactions, will become the magnetic fields in this dual site, and H will be now the new interactions. That is, I am related a dual a dual let's a dual a dual chain where when I apply the magnetic field here equals zero, it's the same as cutting off the interaction between two sides of this dual chain. So it's more visual to understand that this side has no dependence on this other side. Um, we our proof work only when we have one side in the intersection between two sides. But we could ask what it would happen if we have more sides in the interaction. Here is a picture where, uh, where ask x, one side of the, the let's is this black side, it's black set and the, with the red one, and y would be the red with the blue. If I made the external magnetic field here equal zero in this red set, this set here would feel the if I change the parameters here, uh, the answer is no, and we can show this with this with this with the simple example, where here it's my interface, here is one set, and here's the other one here. 2, 3, and 4 would be the Y set, and 1, 2, and 3 would be the X set. Uh, so making this here external magnetic field nu, we can show that um, the reduced state here on site 4 
is test dependence on the magnetic field applied on site one. Uh, here is the some calculations for different values of beta. Here I am varying the magnetic field on site one, and here I'm observing the the, mag the magnetization on site four. Um, it is surprising because if you have one let, uh, I forgot to say that the let of the theorem could be of any dimension, and there is just that hypothesis of one site in the intersection, but that could be any dimension, and that there could be any let, the two sites. But if you put one more site, the property does not work more. We don't understand why, why this work, why, why this, why this happened. Um, so, but when beta tends to infinite, the temperature goes to zero. We can show that the redox state still has no dependence of of the other side. Um, so, in this example, at least the shielding property still works for ground states. Um, and now we ask, does should the property work for ground states of other lights? Uh, we have done some numerical calculations with other examples here, which I show a lights where we have made in these three sites the external magnetic field nu. Here we have changed the parameters and we have looked for the magnetization in the site. And here we can see that in the blue sites, the magnet, the, we change the parameters, but here it is still the same. Uh, here is another example, but very similar to the other, but we just change the, the, the it's the same lights, but we change the sets, the definition of the sets, and the conclusions are the same. Uh, this, this set here cannot feel modifications on parameters here. Um, so, as a summary of the first part, when I have a let like this, just with this condition, we have that the shielding property works for Gibbs state and ground states, since it comes from the theorem. When I have a more general let, we already know that Gibbs state does not work, but about ground state, we do not know yet. Um, another approach for this, this let's here is to ask about dynamics. Now, I am dealing with N Hamiltonian such that it is a sum of two terms, a term of site which is non-trivial only inside side X, only inside set X, that is, it is a Hamiltonian non-trivial only inside this part, and this is a non-trivial outside in the blue part and red part, the set Y. And we ask that this both Hamiltonians, this both terms to commute. Note that the Ising model, when I make the magnetic field nu here, it does satisfy this, this hypothesis here. So uh, it is a the IZ model we are dealing with the first part is a particular case of these other models here. Um, I can show that I will take an observable outside sex X. It is only it it's an observable of the blue sites. Okay? And I will ask about its dynamics. Uh, here I'm using Born Hull to calculate its dynamics. And using the evolution of the state hole, I can use the cyclic property of the trace. I take this term here. It commutes with observable O because they belong to different subsets. And then I have this answer here. So the observable, the, the, val the mean values of observable and uh, any observable of outside set X is independent of the Hamiltonian 8x, satisfying this, that previous 
hypothesis. Um, some consequence is that if I have two systems with different Hamiltonians, they are equal in the in the set Y, but different these terms are different and they have the same initial state, they will have the observable will follow the same dynamics. But if the initial state is different, I could have that these observables still do not follow the same dynamics. The, an example of this statement here is that previous example I have said of the longitudinal IZ model, which one set fills the magnetic field on one on the other side. Um, but when I have the transverse size model and the initial state is the Gibbs state, the, inis the, trans the initial states could be different. And it will be because if these Hamiltonians are different, the Gibbs states are an analytical function of these Hamiltonians and uh, they will be different. But we will still have that the observables will follow the same dynamics since we have proven that the reduced states of operate of of the site that set y are equal. Um, as an illustration of of this of this consequence, we have made a simulation where we have uh, a chain with which is described by the IZ model, and I make the external magnet field here in this site, no. And then we calculated the ground state, and at the moment, the, the initial moment, we changed the magnetic field at the first side. Then we can see the dynamics falling here. It quite reflects here, like it works as above here. Uh, remember that the, this sites here could have interactions really strong and perturbations here do not follow, do not come here. It, sites here we would not never know that that perturbation here was done. Uh, we can relate this picture with um, effective light cons. Uh, as here I have an illustration of um, effective light like Light con, which is already well known in literature, that systems which have short range interaction has a finite velocity of propagation for local quents. So a system far from the local quench would have to wait a finite time to feel the modifications in the system. Since we can, s as we can see in the side here, it takes a moment to change its its values. But we have a stronger condition here that sites here it's not, not not have to wait just a finite time. It will never know. It will never the site signal here would never reach this part. Um, here I just uh, wrote the conclusions I just have told. Um, I finish here. Here my acknowledgments. I thank you for your attention. And I finish with a beautiful winter in Belo Horizonte. <laughs>